special thanks to people who suggested this case, including the White Gormley Brickley and James Lloyd. Thank you for all your suggestions, which I'm slowly working my way through. Now on with the video. Stephen Pauls is a British serial killer and serial rapist who murdered a minimum of four men between 2014 and 2015. However, he's known to have begun drugging and raping men from at least 2012. He met all of his victims through online dating applications, Leantin being dubbed the Grinder Killer. There are two sides to this story. First, the horrific crimes of Port, but also the inaction of the police, which meant that the victim's family was not taken seriously and they suffered further pain outside of losing loved ones. The Port was also free to kill and kill again. Welcome to Evil Among Us. Stephen Paul was born on the 22nd of February 1975 in South End, in the county of Essex, to Joan and Albert Port. He also had an older sister, Sharon. There's little information about Port's early upbringing, but no indicators of abuse. Although it's stated that his father had an issue with homosexuality, and therefore Port kept his attraction to males secret from his parents. Growing up, Port was described as being extremely isolated and considered strange by his classmates and he was frequently bullied. One of his classmates described her interactions with Port, stating, quote, he was quiet, shy and a loner. He sat on his own in class. The other class members were really not nice to him and sometimes you could see the hurt on his face when they were really nasty. I was the only one that really talked to him because it wasn't right how he was treated. I told him to ignore them. We weren't really friends as I myself found him a bit odd. After leaving school at the age of 16, Port went to art college, but it proved too expensive for his parents, and he spent two years training as a chef instead. Port was described as a strange man, and, despite his six foot five frame, was extremely childlike, and even in adulthood, was immature and liked to play with children's toys. Port lived at home with his parents to his early 30s, but in 2006, moved into his own property, 62 Cook Street in Barking, East London, where he committed his offences and will remain until his arrest years later. It's clear that Stephen Port struggled in the real world due to his awkwardness and general lack of social skills. However, on the internet, he could portray himself as anything he wanted to be and would spend all day, every day online, rarely leaving his flat. On the internet, he claimed to have been a graduate of Oxford University served in the armed forces and worked as a special needs teacher in London. None of this was true. Instead, Port worked for 13 years as a chef at West Ham Bus Depot and also did other work, such as door-to-door -door sales. Similarly, as opposed to being a balding man in his 30s, Port would post numerous pictures wearing a wig, clearly trying to make himself more attractive to other men, but also making himself look younger. As an aside, the television show Celebrity Masterchef had an episode filmed in West Ham bus station and Stephen Port appears in the background, albeit briefly. This episode aired in mid-2014, so it was likely filmed earlier that year or potentially in 2013, so before he committed the murders. However, by this point, he was already a rapist and it must have been strange for everyone involved in this episode, knowing that they were standing mere feet away from a future serial killer. Anyway, it's clear that Paul was a man obsessed with sex, specifically with younger men, and at an inquest of one of his victims, it was revealed that he'd sent hundreds of thousands of messages to men on applications such as Grinder, and his neighbors noticed a revolving door of young looking men going into his apartment. It got to the point where, due to how young the men looked, his neighbors were concerned Paul was a paedophile. Port would also use drugs as part of his sexual activities with these men, specifically GHB, a drug originally developed as an anaesthetic, sometimes known simply as G. It's known to reduce inhibitions, increase libido, and sexual sensations become much more intense. It's commonly known as a quote, date rape drug, due to its ability to cause unconsciousness and memory loss, and also because it's an odorless, colorless liquid that can be easily put in someone's drink without them noticing. However, it's also a highly dangerous drug, and in high enough doses, 
could cause coma or even death. Also found on Port's laptop was obsessive viewing of quote, date rape pornography, where he would watch scenarios likely simulated, but potentially not, where men had sex with other men whilst one of them was unconscious. Port would watch hours of this material each and every day. It's clear that Port began to want to replicate this behavior and by 2012, had put his plan into action. It's not clear how many men Stephen Port actually raped, but in court, the earliest victim he was known to have attacked was a 19 year old university student who Port met on Grindr in 2012. The pair chatted and this male went to Port's flat, describing as being quote, polite and friendly and that quote, nothing rang alarm bells. He was then given a glass of wine and noticed congealed powder in the bottom of the glass and immediately believed he'd been spiked. He then became dizzy and disorientated before losing consciousness. He had a vague recollection of being taken into the bedroom, undressed and raped by Port, but was unable to wake himself or fight back. This male was allowed to live and quickly left the property. It appears he was unsure whether what had happened was real or imagined, but when he got to university, he sought medical advice as he believed he'd been drugged. In January 2013, a man called the police and made an allegation they'd been raped by Port on New Year's Eve 2012 and that he'd done this on several occasions before that. This male said that Port applied him with drugs and alcohol to the point he was so under the influence he couldn't say no or fight back and on each occasion Port had only raped him. It doesn't appear that Port was arrested for this allegation and nothing came of it although an entry was put on the police national computer database. The next victim was a male known only as B in court records. B was aged 20 when he met Stephen Port on a dating site for gay men. B went to Port's flat in Barking in June 2014 and stated that Port seemed quote, a very nice guy. B was offered a drink and almost immediately fell unconscious. When he woke up, he was terrified and began shouting and screaming for help. Port, rather than calling the ambulance, supported B whilst walking to Barking train station. B was in a terrible state, vomiting profusely and hardly able to stand. When they got to the station, they were seen by officers from the British Transport Police who saw B incoherent, distressed and vomiting. Port told them that everything was okay and that B had just taken GHB. In court, it couldn't be proven that Port had actually raped B. However, even if this didn't occur, it was clearly the intention. In amongst the crimes against these two men, Port also repeatedly drugged and raped a male known only as C. A couple of things can be taken from this. Firstly, it's clear that Port was drugging men at least two years before he began committing the murders with the intention of raping these individuals. This makes me certain that he must have raped far more men than we know about, as it's unlikely that a man this obsessed with sex and heavily invested in date rape porn would have such large gaps between his offences. Unfortunately, there were likely significant issues of shame with these victims who likely could not recall their attacks and potentially convince themselves that any physical injury they suffered was as a result of consensual sexual activity they could not remember. Others may have felt they could not report it for other reasons, i.e. already being in a relationship, or potentially they felt the police wouldn't take them seriously, which unfortunately, given what happened after this point, seems to be a concern well founded. Secondly, the first victim referred to seeing powder in his drink. I think that Port was experimenting with different drugs for years to determine which would be the most effective at disabling his victims. GHB is a white crystalline powder in its raw form, but it's never normally sold this way. Instead, it's mixed with water to create a liquid solution. So whatever he put in the first victim's drink was something else. I think he then switched to GHB because it's harder to detect and potentially much more effective. Lastly, I think the port saw the attack on B as a mistake and that due to his screaming and crying out for help, he was forced to accompany him to the train station and there he came across the police. I think the port saw this as a close call and he believed he needed to ensure this would never happen again. He needed to make sure his victims were completely under his control 
with no chance of escaping. He could not risk being caught again walking the streets with someone he'd just drugged. So Port decided that these men would not leave his flat alive. Within days of the incident with B, Port was again on the prowl and over the next year, he engaged in a campaign of rape and murder driven by his deviant and predatory sexual appetites. Stephen Port's first confirmed murder victim was 23-year-old Anthony Walgate. It wasn't pronounced Anthony. Anthony was 23 years old and originally from Hull, a city in East Yorkshire, but he moved down to London in order to attend Fashion College. He was the son of a woman called Sarah Sack, a woman whose grit and determination is central to the eventual downfall of Stephen Port. Unfortunately, Anthony was struggling financially and so returned to escorting to make money. On the 17th of June 2014, he was contacted by Stephen Port, who arranged sexual services in exchange for payment of £800. It should be noted that Port had no personal savings, and therefore he clearly had no intention of paying Anthony. Anthony travelled to Barking Station, where the pair met at approximately 10.15pm, and then went back to Port's flat. What happened next is known only to Port, but it's clear that soon after arriving, Anthony was given a fatal dose of GHB, likely in a laced drink, and he fell unconscious. Whether Port raped him whilst he was alive, dying, or indeed dead is unclear. The next day, Port stayed in the flat with Anthony's body and then went to work a late shift. He returned at 4am on the 19th of June 2014 and, after dressing Anthony's body, dragged him outside propping him up by a wall right next to the entrance to the flat complex. Port took Anthony's mobile phone so that their communications could not be seen, planted a small bottle of GHB on his body and then made the following anonymous 999 call. Call the ambulance for the address of the emergency. Miss Cook. Cook Street is a young boy Looks like he's clapped outside, I don't know. Outside of which number? Uh, 4758. Sorry? 4758, I think. 47, Cook Street. Yeah. What, what area? Parking. It looks like you've collapsed or had a seizure or something. It's just always just drunk. Like, yeah. Okay, what's the final thing you're calling from? Uh, I'm just holding up in the car, I've got to get, well, get my car on the parking. Oh. Right, don't worry about that. What's the telephone number you're calling from? Just before 8am on the 19th of June 2014, paramedics and the police attended and it was clear that Anthony was dead. Suspicions were raised almost immediately as Anthony was in a sitting position cross-legged with the paramedics who attended believing that if he'd have simply died from a seizure, he would not have been sat bolt upright, he would likely have slumped over. Also, it was clear that Anthony had been dead for some time. It appeared clear that he died somewhere else, been moved, and then posed. In addition, whilst a small detail, Anthony's underwear was on back to front, which his friends said was never something he would do due to being fashion conscious. At a later inquest, it appears the paramedics did raise their suspicions with the police, but nothing was acted upon. An autopsy showed that Anthony had died from a drug overdose. Sarah Sack was on holiday in Turkey when her son died, and she rushed back to the UK when she heard the news. Her contact with the police was appalling, with the initial phone call telling her son had died apparently lasting only a few minutes, and it was clear there was no investigation into her son's death. The family liaison officer assigned to her had apparently written that Anthony liked to drink and had, quote, dabbled in drugs, specifically cocaine, something Sarah vehemently denied later. Sarah battled the police for months, insisting that her son was murdered, and she criticised the behaviour of the Metropolitan Police in London. Port did eventually fall on the police's radar, as, although he'd taken Anthony's mobile, they were able to trace the number of the phone that made the 999 call. Also, Anthony had told a friend where he was going, and who he was meeting. This led to Stephen Port being arrested on the 26th of June 2014. At this point, 
Port's story magically changed. Anthony had been in his property and they had arranged money for sex, but Anthony had then taken GHB in front of him and died. Port said, due to panicking, he dragged him outside, propped him up and then called 999. Alarm bells should have been ringing. Port was clearly lying to the police on at least one occasion. Also, it was the fact that Anthony had been dead for some time when he was found. He also had no history of using GHB, and if anyone had bothered to look into Port, they would have seen an allegation of rape against a male using drugs in 2012. However, none of this was done, and Port was only charged with perverting the course of justice due to making false reports to the police, and he was released on bail. Another major mistake was that police seized Port's laptop, but it was not examined for 10 months. If it had been checked before, they would have found multiple searches for date rape porn. Within five weeks, and while still on bail, Port committed his second murder. Gabriel Kovari was aged 22 and born in Slovakia, but moved to the UK in June 2014 for a better life. I was hoping to work for the NHS as a translator. Despite only being in the UK for less than two months, Gabriel saw the best and unfortunately the worst in people. He originally met a man called John Pape in July 2014. The pair developed a friendship as opposed to a relationship and Gabriel moved in with him. Although their friendship only lasted six weeks, the pair became close. John was upset when on the 23rd of August 2014, Gabriel moved out, having told him he'd met a man online who'd offered him a place to stay. This man was Stephen Port. It's clear that Port had sexual intentions towards Gabriel as soon as he moved in, with him sending a text to a neighbour telling him he should come round and meet, quote, his new Slovakian twink flatmate, and that he was, quote, taking good care of him, suggesting there was more than just friendship going on between the pair. However, it appears that Gabriel soon regressed his decision, as he was not attracted to Port, and had been sleeping on the sofa, but knew that Port would try to get him into bed. Sometime after 5am, on the 25th of August 2014, Stephen Port administered a fatal dose of GHB in order to rape Gabriel. Port then took to covering his tracks, including using a false identity online, contacting Gabriel's friends, telling them that Gabriel had left the country. By chance, later in the day on the 25th of August 2014, Port's sister rang and later stated in court that her brother was distressed because there was a dead young man in his room. Port, the pathological liar that he appears to have been, later stated in court that the dead young man that he referred to in the conversation with his sister was Anthony Walgate, who had died over a month before and that he was apparently having some sort of flashback. Absolute bollocks. Gabriel's body remained in the flat for some time, clearly whilst Port tried to figure out his next move. In the early hours of the 28th of August 2014, Port transported Gabriel's body, likely wrapped in a bedsheet, to St Margaret's churchyard, approximately 500 metres away from his home. He then placed Gabriel against a wall in a sitting position. Port posed him, placing a pair of sunglasses on his face so someone who saw him at a distance would think he was just asleep. At around 6am that day, so a few hours later, a woman called Barbara Denham was walking her dogs past a graveyard when she saw a young man sat up against a wall who she thought was asleep. She called out, but there was no response. She then went up to him and touched him and concerned that he may have been dead, called the police. Again, a bottle of GHB had been plastered on Gabriel's body. Police attended and it was clear that Gabriel was dead. For some inexplicable reason, the death was determined to not be suspicious with them assuming that Gabriel had accidentally taken a fatal dose of GHB and simply died where he was found. No post-mortem was conducted and Gabriel's body was released to his family overseas for burial. John Pate was informed of the death of his friend and was in shock. He had no indication that Gabriel was a drug user and he raised his concerns about the conclusions drawn by the police. He pointed out the similarities between the death of Gabriel and Anthony Walgate. Specifically, how strange it was that two young men should die of an overdose of the same drug within 500 metres of each other in less than two months. The police ignored his concerns. The police also stonewalled Sarah Sack, who was still trying to be heard about her son. She too had heard about the death of Gabriel, 
I was convinced that there was a link to her son's death. Of course she was correct. But she was ignored. So Stephen Port was in the clear and free to kill again and to claim his third victim. Daniel Whitworth was a 23 year old chef who had his whole life ahead of him. He lived with his partner but unfortunately was also using dating websites for gay men and on the 18th of September 2014 he travelled to Barking train station and met with Port and the pair went back to his flat. Sometime over the next few hours Daniel was administered with a fatal dose of GHB and raped. Whilst Daniel lay dead in the property Port began to cover his tracks. He deleted his dating profile and wrote an apparent suicide note which he then planted on Daniel's body before, under the cover of darkness on the evening of the 19th of September 2014, he took Daniel's body to the same graveyard where he dumped Gabriel's remains. The next morning, a dog walker found his body. Not just any dog walker, Barbara Denham, the same woman who found the body of Gabriel a month before. She later reported her utter disbelief at being confronted by the same situation again. She approached Daniel's body, which was again propped up against a wall, touched his stomach, felt that he was cold, and then called the police for a second time, saying she'd found a body. The body of Daniel was literally five feet away from the spot where Gabriel's body had been found. Police attended and determined there was nothing that could be done for Daniel. Again, he was found with a bottle of GHB on him. But, if they bothered to check, they would have found Port's DNA on his jacket from where he'd been redressed after being murdered. They also found an apparent suicide note, which read, quote, I'm sorry everyone, mostly to my family, but I can't go on anymore. I took the life of my friend, Gabriel Klein. We was just having some fun at a mate's place, and I got carried away and gave him another shot of G. I didn't notice while we was having sex, he had stopped breathing. I tried to get him to start breathing again, but it was too late. It was an accident, but I blame myself for what happened. I didn't tell my family I went out. I know I would go to prison if I went to the police, and I can't do that to my family, and at least this way, I can at least be with Gabriel again. I hope he will forgive me. By the way, please do not blame the guy I was with last night. We only had sex. Then I left. He knows nothing of what I've done. I've taken what G I have left with sleeping pills, so if these kill me, it's what I deserve. Feeling dizzy now, as took 10 minutes ago, so hoping you understand my writing. I dropped my phone on my way here, so it should be in the grass somewhere. This whole situation, but especially the note, should have been a massive red flag. Firstly, you have three young men all found dead within 500 metres of each other, two of them mere feet apart, in the space of two months, none of whom were known to be regular users of GHB. If proper checks had been done, they would have found it odd that Daniel apparently was so bereft at killing his good friend Gabriel that he got his surname wrong, calling him Klein instead of Kavari. Also, they would have found the whole situation very odd, considering that Daniel had never even met Gabriel and there was no evidence they even knew of each other's existence. Also, what an oddly phrased suicide note, with a man apparently in the throes of grief and utter despair that he'd taken the life of his friend, but he takes time to mention the man he just had sex with and says not to blame him. Blame him for what? Why even mention that at all? Clearly mention of sexual activity between Gabriel and Daniel in this note was to make the police think that any evidence of this would be explained in addition, if they'd bothered to check the phone records of Gabriel and Daniel, they would have seen they were nowhere near each other on the date that Gabriel died. Clearly, Stephen Port thought he was very clever trying to pin Gabriel's murder on Daniel, but this note is amateur hour for the reasons I've mentioned, and this should have launched a major investigation due to the overwhelming evidence that a serial killer was operating in the area. But nothing happened. Sarah Sack was still fighting for justice for her son, but was also now fighting for the families of both Gabriel Carrari and Daniel Whitworth. The families united and continued to put pressure on the police to take things seriously and actually investigate crimes, but they were all ignored. However, there is shocking evidence of very underhanded tactics employed by the police. In particular, in the case of Daniel's death, 
Police records claim that the handwriting of the suicide note was confirmed as being a match to Daniel by his family, something they stated never happened. So the police chalked his death up to a suicide and made no attempts to investigate further. Stephen Port apparently did not kill again for a year, but he continued to drug and rape other men. He attacked at least three men, known as males D, E and F. Male D was extremely vulnerable. He met Port in January 2015 and had his drink spiked at his flat and was then raped. Port filmed the rape, then showed it to D, who was obviously horrified. At this point, there's a gap of a few months in Port's offending, but this is only because he finally went to court for perverting the course of justice related to the death of Anthony Walgate. On the 23rd of March 2015, Port was sent to prison for eight months for this offence. The court had no idea the man they were sending down for this simple offence had killed at least two people and raped multiple men. Port was released on June the 4th, 2015 and within a month had attacked another man. This was E, who was 35 years old and who met Port on Grinder in July 2015. By this point, Port appears to have been experimenting with different ways to drug men and so, when the pair were at his flat, Port used a syringe to inject drugs straight into the anus of E. E felt a burning, painful sensation and immediately knew something was wrong. He got up, dressed and left. Male F was already known to Port and they reconnected via Grinder in September 2015. Again, F went to his flat, but he made it clear that he did not wish to do any drugs. Under the pretense of applying lubrication, Port again injected drugs directly into F's anus. He felt a burning sensation and started to feel lightheaded, but luckily did not fall unconscious and was able to escape. Why Port let these men live is unclear, but I think that even he knew that he'd got away with things up to this point and that he couldn't risk having another dead body on his hands. However, his murderous impulses took over and he would claim another victim soon afterwards. Jack Taylor was a 25 year old man who lived with his parents in Dagenham and worked as a forklift driver. On the 12th of September 2015, Jack went out drinking with his friends. He then went home and accessed Grinder and began speaking to Port and they agreed to meet at Barking Train Station. This haunting CCTV footage shows the pair meeting and walking back to Port's flat, essentially Jack's last walk. I don't know about you, but there's a part of me that just wants to shout telling Jack to stop and go home, however ridiculous that might sound. What happened in Port's flat will never be known for certainty, but it's clear that Jack was drugged and raped and was dead by 7.30am, so around four hours after meeting Port, as he then began covering his tracks, deleting the grinder app from both his and Jack's phone in order to delete the messages. Jack's body remained in the flat the entire day of the 13th of September 2015, and when it got dark, Port again carried or dragged his body to the same graveyard 
where he disposed of his last two victims. He placed Jack's body propped against a wall, again just a few feet away from where he dumped Gabriel and Daniel, but this time on the opposite side of the wall. Port planted a bottle of GHB on Jack, as well as a syringe, and took his phone, dumping it. Jack's body was found by a passerby, this time not the same dog walker as before, and the police were called. Again, stunningly, they appeared to take the evidence at face value and determined that Jack had probably taken a fatal overdose, potentially accidentally. Case closed. Jack's family were informed of his passing and were adamant that something was wrong. They stated that Jack had aspirations of becoming a police officer and so was very firmly anti-drug. It got to the point where Jack's family were doing their own investigation, compiling their own handwritten evidence and sending it to the police. However, they, like Sarah Sack, who was still banging down every door and calling everyone she could, were ignored, with the police stating that there was no reason to link Jack's passing to any of the three previous deaths in the last 16 months. It appears that Stephen Port was caught by chance in the end. A detective reviewing the death of Anthony Walgate happened to see the CCTV footage of Jack Taylor walking from Barking train station with a male. When this detective looked at the footage, he realised the person walking with Jack was Stephen Port, a man who'd been involved in the case of Anthony. At this point, the pieces finally fell into place, with links being made with all the victims and Port, and his background was properly checked and the content of his laptop reviewed. A new team of investigators were assigned, and finally, on the 15th of October 2015, Stephen Port was arrested on suspicion of four counts of murder. He was interviewed the next day, and, whilst he didn't go no comment, he gave very little truthful information. I've included the full release clip of the interview, which is 11 minutes long, as I think it's fascinating, but also people who like analysing body language will have plenty of material. If you want to skip it, as I said, it's about 11 minutes long. So did you, did you have any involvement in the, uh, the death of the male that we just spoke about a short while ago, Gabriel Cavari or Gabriel Klein? No, I didn't have that. So were you involved in administering any drugs or poisons or noxious substances to him? No, I don't administer drugs to anyone or give drugs to anyone. Um, that's done at the party by someone else. The name I recognised when I party to mention before was the is one of the parties who deals with uh, administrating drugs. Who, who's that, sorry? Uh, Daniel. I can ask him. He sometimes he's at the, he's at the, he deals, he hands out the drugs to uh, the guests. Daniel, this is the male yeah. that we spoke of earlier. So, yeah. It might not be the same guy, I really don't know, but is there only Daniel I don't know? Or, I spoke to him a couple of times at the party. I remember his name. Uh, but uh, he was, he does, like when I did, Scott would ask him to pick up guys, take them to the party. Mm -hmm. And he would, but he would stay, but I want he would stay in the minister or do out the uh, hand out with you know, drugs, or whatever. But I, uh, I would leave where he would stay. And did you go with Daniel to meet people? No, no he's, I knew he was doing the same as I was, but I've seen him at that party and I had a brief conversation with him about it, but I've never actually engaged with him outside of uh, the place. Outside of a party? Right. And which parties were these? Um, well, he's got to go to the, the fat parties. Scots parties? Yeah. The fat party. Fat party, F R A T. Frat parties. <coughs> so, when was the first occasion that you met the person that you're, you're talking of, uh, someone that you know as Daniel? Um, I think that's one of the 
first few occasions I was I was there. It was the first time I bought a graph for Scott and Daniel was there. Um, yeah. So I don't even know if it is the same Daniel we're talking about, but he's the only Daniel I would can recall as such. Um, I remember I think his name was Whitworth, it rings a bell, but you think his name was Whitworth? Yeah. I mean if he's a tall almost as tall as me, I brown hair. Slim uh might help if I show um, your picture. I'll call this CRT two. This is Jack Taylor. Do you recognise that mate? Hmm. Full attention to the guys' faces when I have paint the to the um, parties. This, um, but I don't recognise his face. So, so you don't recognise his face? I do not know. No. Okay. And, and I mean, they, that's Jack Taylor. So you don't recognise? No, I don't. Jack Taylor. No. So, have you ever slept with this male? No. Has sexual intercourse with him? He doesn't look like the type I'd go with myself. He's not the sort of person you'd go for? No, I tend to more. He's more younger, drinky boys, more, you know, more younger boys, but not, uh, he looks older. Be similar to the type I've taken to, to parties, but I don't recognise him as being one of them. So you don't recognise him as being one of them? No. No. Okay. And, and Jack, again, was, was found dead. It was on the, 20, on the 14th of September 2015. Stephen, did you have any involvement in his death? I did not know, no. Did you kill Jack Taylor? I did not know. No. Did you administer any drugs or noxious substances to him? I did not know. With the intention of causing him harm? No. Did no. you not? No. no. And you say you've never seen him before? Is that right? That's right. That's right. Okay, I've got another map here, CRT8. So I'm just trying to show you as many maps of the area because it's not easy to get it all in one one uh, piece of paper, just so that we're, we're clear here. Uh, and again, it shows your uh, home address and it shows uh, the church, St Margaret, and the, the, behind it you've got the, uh, the abbey and the primary school. In particular, the area around um, the walls of the abbey. Have you ever had any reason to go into that area? No. Have you, ever, have you ever been uh, through into the Abbey? Uh, no, I haven't. No. No, I don't really go to the church areas. No. No. I think I went, went, one, once went to that church. With my ex Danny, went to the church on a, on a Christmas day um, and into the church, but that's as far as I got, as far as I. You've not been into the grounds behind it where you've got the the uh, old abbey oh, no, no, it walls. No, no, gosh. No grounds there. No, it looks a spooky sign, won't go there. You've never, you've never been in there? No. In all the eight years that you've lived across the road from the park? No. I thought it was all private, I wouldn't go there. I think it's private area, I thought. But also the church. 
it's, it's fairly open, isn't it, when you when you go past? Would you agree with that or not? Well, the field is, yeah, yeah. the field is, but uh, the church bit behind the walls, we'll go past there. Because um, three of the four people that have been found dead were found uh, slumped up against the wall here of the Abbey. Pardon? Yeah, I didn't know that. Sorry. You didn't know that? So that's news to you, is it? Did you put them there? No, no. So obviously Anthony was found slumped outside your address with uh, a large amount of GHB in his system. Mm. The other three men we've been discussing were all found over by the wall area of the abbey, we can see on the map. Mm. Uh, again, all of them were slumped against the wall with a large amount of GHB in their body. Can you account for that at all? No, I can't. I mean, Stephen, did you did you write this letter here, CRT 11? No, I didn't. The photos of it that's found with Daniel? No. No. I think not. Are you telling us the truth, Stephen? I am telling you the truth, yes. About the letter? Yes. I am telling you About all of these boys? Yeah. Young boys in the early stages of their youth, really, in terms of in their early twenties, all found dead. Stephen, yeah, I understand, but close to your house, one of them had been in your house either just before at the time when he died and was found to have large quantities of a drug in his system. The other three were all found just over the road in the churchyard, or just beside the churchyard in that area that we've discussed, yeah. propped up against the wall, a short distance from your house, all again with high levels of GHB in them, enough to kill them. Highly unusual way to die for one person. This is four all found very close to where you live. All men, young men, type of men that you say that you find attractive. All now dead, Stephen. Anthony, I know nothing about the uh, three, how they come to be. Stephen, this is serious. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. It's really important that you tell us the absolute truth. So far, it's true. The Stephen Port pleaded not guilty to all offences and, in October 2016, went on trial at the Old Bailey in London. Port tied himself in knots and his claims changed rapidly, with him saying that he didn't know the victims to admitting that he did and then saying that they were in his flat and that apparently all of them had taken overdoses of GHB in front of him. The court did not believe him and Stephen Port was found guilty of the murders of Anthony Walgate, Gabriel Cavari, Daniel Whitworth and Jack Taylor. He was also found guilty of drugging with the intention of raping or actually raping seven men between 2012 and 2015. On the 25th of November 2016, Stephen Port was set for sentencing before Mr Justice Oppenshaw, who, whilst running through Port's long, long list of offences, stated, quote, self-evidently, the defendant is highly dangerous.
he then sentenced him. Justice Openshaw stated, quote, I have no doubt that the seriousness of the offending is so exceptionally high that the whole life order is justified. Indeed, it is required. The sentence, therefore, upon the counts of murder is a sentence of life imprisonment. I decline to set a minimum term. The result is a whole life sentence, and the defendant will die in prison. Therefore, Stephen Port joined the list of prisoners in the UK who will never be released. To this day, he continues to maintain his innocence for his offences. After Stephen Port was caught, and due in large parts of the victim's families, the Metropolitan Police referred itself to the Independent Office for Police Conduct, the IOPC, and an investigation was launched. The police looked at the involvement of 17 officers involved in Stephen Port's case and found that nine had demonstrated performance which had, quote, fallen below the standard required. They were reprimanded for, quote, performance failings, but allowed to remain in service. And, to add insult to injury, in 2021, the Metropolitan Police confirmed that five of these officers had been promoted. The coroner's inquest stated that inaction in the investigation of Anthony Wargate's death, quote, probably contributed to the deaths of the other three men. In June 2022, the IOPC stated they would be launching a fresh inquiry into the police's handling of the Stephen Port case, but given that the original investigation took two years, there'll be no answers quickly, and by the time a report is published, potentially these same officers will have been promoted again. I think the term probably is indicative of British culture, with us being very polite and not wishing to offend. I'll leave it to my viewers to determine what they think, but I would say the police failings definitely led to Port being allowed to kill and rape people after his first murder. All of the victims' families and friends accused Metropolitan Police of institutional homophobia. They also pointed out how inevitably the police would have handled this case differently if the four victims had been women. I think it's horrific that the family and friends of these young men had to basically put their grief aside in order to become detectives because the people whose job it actually was to do this were so useless. Total respect to them. So, what could be said about Stephen Port? What was the thinking of this serial murderer? I think that ultimately Port's behaviour was driven by inadequacy. He was a man who had poor social skills, a menial job, and, at quite a young age, was losing his hair. These are clearly things that Port was unable to come to terms with, so he had to project lies about success on the internet and walk around with a wig in order to project the man he wanted to be, not the person he was. The internet was his escape. On there, he could be anyone he wanted. He could feel a sense of belonging and acceptance, likely from the thousands of men he interacted with online. It's common for men and women who have significant issues with their self-esteem to use sex as a way to make themselves feel better temporarily. In these moments, they feel wanted and temporarily they can forget about how they actually feel. Chasing this feeling can become addictive and it's clear that this was the case with Stephen Port. While Stephen Port is known as the grinder killer, he used around 10 different dating websites and apps and was obsessed with filling his life with sexual encounters, which I think were an escape from his daily life. I think that Port being described as childlike is also a relevant part to understanding him. As a child, we are taught self-control and that we can't have everything we want. Port appears to have learnt neither of these things. However, I think that as time went on, this didn't have the same impact on Port the high of meeting random men for sex was starting to wane. He needed to escalate his behaviour. Port became obsessed with rape pornography. I think watching this gave him an idea of how to use sex to have control over another human being. And he started to replicate what he'd seen. He also took people's lives, which was the ultimate demonstration of his power over them. I imagine that Port was most likely ecstatic going through the list of men online, thinking about who he could have sex with, with their level of consent meaning nothing. They were just objects to use and abuse. When he met them, it didn't matter that he had extremely poor social skills, or was very odd, or wore a wig. They wouldn't live long enough to mock him about these things. He was in complete control. Once he had finished with one victim, he dumped them like rubbish, before moving on 
and looking for more men to drug, rape and murder. Watching footage of Stephen Port makes me realise just how good Stephen Merchant's performance was in the 2022 series called Four Lives, which, if you can find it, is well worth a watch. I think it's still on BBC iPlayer. In my opinion, Stephen Merchant perfectly captures the strange, lumbering demeanour of Port, but also hints at something else, especially during the court scenes, extreme violence and anger. And I think deep within Port, despite his quiet and shy demeanour, is a core of anger and violent tendencies which he had no desire to control. Stephen Port is inevitably a psychopath, and, if released, I have no doubt he would keep killing. However, he'll never get the chance, as Stephen Port's life will end behind prison bars. So, what are your thoughts on this case? Not just the crimes of Stephen Port, but also the police investigation. If you like the content, please consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button. It's £2.99 a month, or around $4.00 and you get early access to videos and an icon next to your name. You can also send a super thanks, which is a one-off payment to support the channel. Also, please like, share and subscribe. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one.